Will you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 2, please? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. If you were in my Bible and I have a testament, it'd be 308. But you're on your own. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels were steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? The greatest danger facing us today in America and the Church of Jesus Christ, not the situation with the terrorists, not the loss of Social Security, though that uh, sends chills up and down our back sometimes, up and down our spine. The greatest danger is the Church of Jesus Christ drifting and Christians drifting in their faith. And there are too many of us, I'm afraid, who are doing just that. We're just drifting along with the current and we, we're forgetting because Hebrews 1 tells us that Jesus Christ is God. In Hebrews 1.8, But under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. And then they go on to show how that he was in on all of the creation and how that he is Lord of all. And therefore, he demands and deserves our best. Now the text is a warning. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. One translation puts it this way, it's crucial we keep a firm grip on what we've heard so that we don't drift off. Did you get that? We've heard so many, so many times the preaching of the word and the teaching of the word of God. We've read the word of God and we grew up, many of us grew up cutting our teeth on the word of God. But it's crucial that we keep a firm grip on what we've heard so we don't just drift off. Now the warning is to all of us. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, he said, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Many have drifted and many have fallen. Preachers have fallen and drifted away from the faith. Deacons have fallen and drifted away from the faith. I was holding meetings out in western Iowa one time, and I was going to that Sunday through Wednesday evening in a Baptist church, and I was scheduled to leave the next morning. I was being entertained in the home of the head deacon of that church. It was a pretty good-sized church. The last day at noon, I had lunch with the preacher, and he was... He was crying on my shoulder about some of the things at the church. And he says, my head deacon is too cozy with the church secretary. He said, that's not the worst of it. The church secretary's husband is the chief of the local police. Well, when I went back to the host house, I told my hostess, that I was going to pack up. I thought I would leave right after the meeting. I didn't want to be there when the bullets were flying. But uh, churches, uh, churches drift off too. Bud and I know of a church within driving distances, 15 minutes of here. We both grew up in that church. The gospel was preached. The Bible was open. And now it's almost nothing more than a social order. Why do we drift? Hasn't God blessed us? Hasn't he given us many wonderful, wonderful things? Well, there is a song that we just sang. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And Paul said in the book of Galatians, chapter 5 and verse 17, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, so that these are the contrary one to another. In other words, doing the natural thing, doing just what comes naturally, like the old song used to say, we just drift off, you know, in complacency, getting too busy, neglect spiritual things because there are so many demands now. But we're saved and on our way to heaven and we ought to be thanking God every day. And every day that we can get up 
and put clothes on and, and go out. We ought to thank God for the strength. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. What more could we say? But thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God has given us a new heart. And basically, we are spiritual beings. We have a body. The problem is the old nature is still there, pulling us down and pulling us back. But God lives within us. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The spiritual life should be first and foremost in our lives. This should be the priority, following God every day. But we drift along, satisfied that we're saved and our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and we have a title deed to a mansion on high. Hallelujah, we're, we're on our way to heaven and we forget the rest. But the text warns against a wasted life. He said, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to those things. Literally, the Hebrew is saying in that word ought, must. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to those things that we have heard and been taught, unless we drift. Now, Jesus has saved us from hell, and he saved us from the cesspool of this world. Psalm 40 is a beautiful psalm, and verse 2 says he has, he has lifted us up out of a horrible pit. Aren't you glad that Jesus saved you? Mm -hmm. As you look around and see the mess that some people have made of their lives, your age, getting into either drink or drugs, and they've just wasted their lives or wasted it completely on self and selfish things, and yet God has kept you. And we ought to thank God. And we should do more than give him just the dregs of our life or the tag end of our life or one hour a week, and so on. He said, give them more earnest heed, but give careful attention to the things we've heard. You see, we have an enemy. That enemy is called Satan, and he's surrounded by a host of demons that will work on us to trip us up and to, de uh, to divert us from the main path and the main course. And you know it's hard to read your Bible sometimes, you know it's hard to pray. So many thoughts are going through your head. And you've got so many things to do. I mean, wow, there's that, there's that game to watch. There's that, there's that soap to watch. And so we lose ourselves and we just drift and we let them slip. They tell us that a number of years ago, a man was in a rowboat fishing up on a Niagara River. And you can do that safely if you're up far enough away from falls. But apparently he fell asleep. And all of a sudden people saw this boat drifting towards the fall. And he must, have, he must have been awakened either by people hollering at him or the noise of the falls. Mary and I have been there and it is noisy. We didn't go over the top, but he did. He started to roll, but he could not do it. And they watched this horror struck as he just slipped over the edge and into death. But little by little, we cool off. John wrote to the book, in the book of uh, Hebrews, the book of Revelation, the second chapter, the fourth verse, to the church of Ephesus, the highest, the pinnacle of the churches, the early church. He said, you've left your first love. You've cooled off in the things of God. So therefore, verse two is a warning. For the word, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of the word. How shall we escape? Now the word of God is important. And the word of God is forever settled in heaven. The word of God was given for us by God, written by holy men of God of old, guided by the Holy Spirit to say to us just what God had for us and giving us the complete mind of God. And the angels have been witness to it. In fact, one day a couple of angels were going across the desert there, the wastelands of what is now Israel. And they came to the tent of Abraham. And they told him about Sodom and Gomorrah and how God was going to judge those two cities because of the sodomy, because of, of all that was going on there. 
And Abram began to pray. He said, Lord, if you find, because Lot, his nephew, was down there. So Lot's, Lot was his nephew, and it was like a son to Abraham. He began to pray. And he said, Lord, if there are 50 just people there, will you destroy the city? God said, no. 45? God said, no. 40? No. He got clear down to 10. And then he stopped praying. But there were not ten people there. You see, Lot, who had been raised with Abraham, Lot, who had that privilege of being with this man of God, all of those years as they came out of Ur of the Chaldees and then into the promised land, though it was not the Jewish promised land at that time, but of just rubbing shoulders with this great man of God. But then they went their separate ways, and Lot went down, and his soul was vexed, the Bible tells us, because of all the sin in the city. He didn't like what was going on, but he stayed there. That's the idiotic thing about it. Apparently, he was doing well financially, and he stayed there. But the angels went down into that city and warned him, said, get out of here, get out of here. God's going to destroy these cities. And he practically had to drag him out, his two daughters and his wife. That's all. He went out to try to get people to wake up. But they would not wake up. And so finally the, the angel dragged them out. But Lot's wife turned around and headed back toward Lot. And that's, that was her home. That's probably where Lot met her. And her family was there. And God rained down destruction upon those cities. Now if the word of angels, as it says here, was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward, that, that simply means... That you can count on it because it's the word of God that they were saying. And the word of God never changes. The word of God is steadfast and is sure. It's a, the text is saying to us, wake up, wake up. And as sure as God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, God will judge America and God will judge the world. And someday every person is going to have to stand before him in excuse me, a personal witness. Now come to verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now we use this verse for non-Christians. And sometimes I have used this uh, when I've been witnessing. How can we escape if we refuse the Lord Jesus Christ and his crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his forgiveness? If you won't have it, how can you escape? There is no answer. God can't even answer it. There is no other way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way. But I want you to notice the verse. How shall we, not they, how shall we, is speaking to Christian people. How shall we escape if we slip, if we drift away from the things of God, if we just try, uh, try so casually to live the Christian life and let things just go right on by? And the word is neglect. How shall we who neglect so great a salvation not reject? Because we've accepted it. One of these days, folks, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And, and 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 says that we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we shall be judged according to the things that we have done in the flesh. What have you done for Jesus? God has given you 24 hours in every day, and seven days a week, and many, many years since you've been saved. Have you ever done one thing except take up space? Have you ever done one thing for God? Have you ever led one person to Christ, maybe not actually pointing them and praying with them, but brought them to church? Have you done anything for the Lord Jesus? And God says, you see, I, I, we're not playing games. I want to come back to the book of Corinthians and the third chapter for just a moment. And I want to read, beginning in verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For the foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work should be made manifest. All right, we have been given opportunities We've been, each one of us, given at least one gift or talent that we can invest for the Lord, whatever it might be with you. You may be sending out cards. It could be just calling on the telephone to encourage someone. 
It could be making a call with a tape or with a supper, whatever the case may be. We have been given, we have been given the advantage of having a gift of something that we can invest for the Lord Jesus. Not everybody is a Sunday school teacher. Not everybody can play the trombone. Not everybody can play the piano and organ. But we can all do something. And whatever God has given us to do, we are to do. And we're to build upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says we can build with gold, silver, precious stones, things that are eternal. Little doggies and little kitties are, are beautiful. A lot of people are in love with them. And that's all right. But remember, it's people. It's people that are the important thing. I'll pay for this. <laughs> But some of you kitty people, you know what I'm talking about too. And people, this is where it is. Souls are eternal. You see? Or wood, hay, and stubble. We just do our own thing. Invest in our own thing. Spend time on our own thing. Entertain to keep ourselves happy. But verse 13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. There at the judgment seat of Christ, it may be in just a flash of moment, from the time we were saved until the time we go home. Our life will be judged and will be put to the fire of God's judgment. Whether it's an actual fire or not, it doesn't make any difference. It's the judgment of God. And only those things that are eternal that we have done will last. Our score at golf won't matter one, one iota at that time. And so many other things won't matter at that time either. But it says, if any man's work should be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved by fire. Don't you think there'll be many tears shed at the judgment seat of Christ? Wasted years, wasted opportunities, wasted time. You say, I can't do a whole lot. God doesn't expect you if he hasn't given you a multitude of gifts to do a whole lot. But we do what we can for Jesus. Our life belongs to him. He is our Lord. He is our master. He is our savior. And he wants to work through us, live through us to the blessing of other people. And we are to build with eternal building blocks upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwell in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple are you? And some of us, because we've frittered away our entire life, are going to be naked before God. We're going to be humbled before God. We're going to be speechless before God at this time at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm sure that we're going to cry. Of course, God ultimately is going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. But folks... Whatever the past is, put that under the blood. And go on from this moment on for Jesus. But we may drift. But God, one way or the other, is going to punish. According to verses 2 and 3. And Paul reminded the Corinthian believers as they partook of communion, which is a reminder of who God is and what God has done for us and who we are, that we are to judge ourselves. And that if we don't, and we take partake of the Lord's Supper or just live foolishly and carelessly, he said, for this reason, many are sick, many are weak, and many are dying. Now you think about that for a moment. It is possible because James talks about this in the fifth chapter. He said, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them anoint him with oil, pray over him. And if he sinned, he'll be forgiven. Sometimes sickness is because of the way I've lived and God's trying to get our attention. He'll burn our fields. God doesn't want to burn our fields. God doesn't want to... to uh, for us to be sick, but sometimes that's the only way he can get our attention. I want to say this too, however, there is much sickness in the world and Christians are not exempt 
from sickness. And there are many disasters that happen in the world. And we're not exempt from these things. And the loss of home, the loss of job, is not necessarily because you and I have sinned. But we need, when there is sickness coming into our lives, or when there is loss, when there is problem of any kind, to just fall on our face before God and, and try to clear things up as much we, as we can between ourselves and God. Because, you see, sickness happens to all people. Disaster happens to all people, even Christians. But there's sometimes we bring things on ourselves. And this is what he's talking about in the book of Hebrews in chapter 2. And God loves us too much to just let us drift. I had a dad that was very patriotic. He wanted me to be just like him. Well, fortunately, unfortunately, I'm just like my dad. I wish I were more like my mother. But every once in a while, you know, he would lay down stripes and I'd see stars. That's because he wanted me to learn to be a good boy. Didn't work, but he, he, tried, he tried his dead level best. Now, God does the same thing. And so sometimes, God, uh, you see, God loves us too much to let us just drift. And so God may take us up short to get our attention sometimes and head us in the other direction. Well, Christianity is a seven day a week, 24 hour a day life. And it should be ours every day. Now it's a little hard for me, getting up in the morning, to say, Lord, hallelujah, I love you. Lord, what are we going to do today? It's exciting. Because it takes me an hour or two reading my Bible before I can get out of holy grunt. But, you know, it's, it's, your life should be in the hands of God. 24-7. Your life belongs to God. You should say, God, what do you want me to do? Lord, in the life is the life that I'm living for you now what you really want? And see, God comes right in where you are. God comes in, and if you need to be moved out of that place, God will help you do that. But God will move in, and he wants to walk with you and make Christianity a vital thing right where you live and right where you work and around the circle of people that you know. And we need to say, Lord, take over in my life. Dedicating our life or rededicating our life to Jesus Christ should be the important thing. We're already a Christian. Thank God for that. But now we need to dig deeper. Folks, I believe with all my heart what we're seeing on the international scene right now and what we're seeing in America, that the rapture of the church is very near. And any time, any moment, we can hear that voice saying, come on up, little children, we'll hear the trumpet sound. And we're out of here. We're out of here. I think it's going to happen soon in the time we have left. Let's make the days, the hours, the minutes count for Jesus Christ. Let's read our Bible. Now, I realize if you get into Chronicles, it's just not that, it's just not that inspiring. Until you get to the fourth chapter, and down in verses 9 and 10, then you hit a pot of gold. That was Jabez and his prayer. And it's like hitting an oasis. When Mary and I were overseas, we had to eat from the menu. We didn't like to eat sometimes what we got at the restaurants. Every once in a while, we'd hit an army base. And my brother was in the army, so we could get on. And, and we could have a good old-fashioned American hamburger, and it was an oasis in the middle of that desolate area of Europe. Wherever you are, whatever your life is, dedicate it to God. Whoever you are, you're a child of God. If you're not, I ask the question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? If you've never opened your heart to Jesus Christ, do it. <coughs> and do it now. Just realizing what he has done for you, his death, his burial, his resurrection, shedding his blood on the cross of Calvary to forgive our sins. Because we were sinners without hope and hell bound. Come to him and say, Lord, I'll trust you now. I give my heart to you. Come into my heart. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity that is ours of living for you. We thank you for this great country, but we thank you for heaven that is our real home. And someday we're going to be there, perhaps soon. Until that time, Father, help us to capture every opportunity and to live every moment to the utmost for you. Help us, Father, that even this day, 
to realize the areas where we need to change and then to make that change as we follow you and walk step in step with the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray that if there's one here that has never opened their heart to Jesus before, I pray that even right now as we're praying, they would whisper in your ear, dear God, Jesus, I'll accept you now. Come into my heart and forgive my sins. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.